This is the Flying Fickle Finger of Fate Award, which will be given each week to that person or group who have proven they truly deserve to receive the Flying Fickle Finger of Fate Award. And our first winner is... May I have the envelope, please? Go get the envelope, Goldie. Thank you. And the winner is the United States Congress, established 1781 as a lobby for the American people for ignoring the wishes of 200 million Americans and delaying passage of a gun control law. We hereby present Congress with a first flying fickle finger of fate. <laughs> You ought to be more careful with that thing. I didn't know it was loaded. And now it's time to give the Flying Fickle Finger of Fate Award. And this week, the delightful digit goes to the United States Public Health Service. And it's not for nothing that they get this award. That's right. The Public Health Service prepared a pamphlet. The pamphlet is entitled, The Demography of Happiness. It cost $249,000 of your money. But the money wasn't wasted because here are some of the things they found out and we quote. People who make more money are happier than people who make little money. <laughs> people who are in good health are happier than people who are in ill health. <laughs> True. And young people are happier than old people. <laughs> We're having the fickle finger of fate delivered to the Public Health Service by Mrs. Rowena Thing of beautiful downtown Burbank. Uh, tell me, Mrs. Thing. It's Miss Thing, darn it. Oh, uh, <laughs> Miss Thing, uh, what qualifies you to make this presentation? I'm old, sick, <coughs> and very poor. When you get to Washington and meet the folks from the Public Health Service, what are you going to do? Oh, I'm really going to give it to them. Public Health Service, you've got it coming to you. Yes. Uh, but seriously, folks, it's time for the Flying Fickle Finger of Fate Award. Who is the lucky winner tonight? The lucky winner tonight is the Senate Judiciary Committee. Oh, oh, what have those little rascals done this day? Well, there was an obscenity case. <gasps> an extremely sexy movie. Aha! Uh -huh. uh -huh. Maybe if we leave now, we could still catch it. Oh, it's very serious, Dick. In their tireless efforts to protect the moral fibers of all decent, God-fearing Americans, uh -huh. some members of the Senate Judiciary Committee forced themselves to view this lewd motion picture. They forced themselves? Yes. Oh. And then what do you think they did? They watched it again. No. Poor baby. No. They uh -huh. said it was... They ran it backwards. I'm going to tell you what they did. They said it was filthy, pornographic, and shouldn't be seen by any decent person. Uh -huh. And then... They watched it again. Uh -huh. And so, hey. tonight, because of their fearless and constant vigilance in shielding us yeah. from these goodies, uh. our flying fickle finger of fate award goes to the Senate Judiciary Committee. You've certainly got it coming to you. Right. <laughs> when are they going to show it again? <laughs> Moving right along now, it's time again for the coveted flying fickle finger of fate award. When we single out some deserving citizen or group and give it to them. I already have the envelope, and tonight's winner is... The Ku Klux Klan. Uh, what are those wizards up to now? Well, they ordered the Xerox Corporation to uh, remove its copying machine from Klan headquarters in Birmingham, Alabama. Mercy, mercy, whatever put an idea like that in their hoods. Well, see, it's like this. Xerox sponsored of Black America. Mm -hmm. Great TV series devoted to updating Negro history and correcting misconceptions about the black race. Mm -hmm. And I guess the Klan just <laughs> wasn't too thrilled about the whole idea. Gee, I wish we had an inter-office memo on that. I'd like to run off a few copies for the bottom of my birdcage. Oh? <laughs> my bird loves to read, you know. Oh, I see. <laughs> right. And so tonight, Ku Klux Klan, in recognition of your continuing efforts to poison the relations between the races, we give it to you. Stranger than truth. 
In 1942, Herbert Cranston from Virginia and Bill Baker from Pittsburgh were shot down over France. They were captured by the Germans and shared the same small cell for two years, manacled together by their wrists. They managed to escape, were sheltered in a four by 12 foot basement by the French resistance group until the end of the war, when they went their separate ways. Bill Baker back to Pittsburgh, Herbert Cranston back to Virginia. 20 years later, Bill Baker pulled into a filling station in the Blue Ridge Mountains of Virginia. The attendant opened the door, and to Bill's amazement, he smiled, put out his hand, and he said, you're our millionth customer. You've just won a free snow tire. <laughs> now it's time once again, dear friends, to award our flying fickle finger of fate. And who gets it this week? The 538 members of the Electoral College. Now, as you may or may not know, our next president will be the candidate who receives a majority. Well, I certainly hope so. Now, I want you to pay attention. Should neither Mr. Nixon nor Mr. Humphrey receive a majority, the election would then be thrown into the House of Representatives, who would decide among themselves who will be the next president. Is this going to take much longer? No, not very much. Now, let's say that George Wallace carries only Rhode Island this year. Blow in their ears, they'll vote for anybody. <laughs> Rhode Island, the smallest state with four electoral votes. Let's say that Mr. Nixon and Mr. Humphrey tie. Fascinating, Dr. Zargoff. Do go on. I intend. The election would then be thrown into the House of Representatives. Hmm, so what? So what? Well, that simply means they could then elect George Wallace our next president. Oh, oh, well, let's give it to the Electoral College. That's what we intend to do. Goldie, bring in the award, please. Buenos dias, La Cienega, and <laughs> tacos. <laughs> What's that, Goldie? Well, I'm just practicing my Spanish. Oh, you going to Berlitz? <laughs> no, but, um... <laughs> Elected on four votes, I'm moving to Argentina. <laughs> Electoral College, you've got this coming to you. But seriously, folks, it's time once again for the Flying Fickle Finger of Fate Award. Oh, it's better than that. Tonight we're giving the Flying Fickle Finger of the Year Award. How right you are. And it was a very close struggle. The award for eight balls of the year must go to Soviet Russia. Hey, they beat out Congress and Mayor Daly, huh? But not without a tough fight, boy. Well, what exactly was it that won for the good Russians? Well, it was their great love of freedom. Mm. Mm -hmm. You see, in fact, the Russians are such a freedom-loving people that they wanted all the freedom they could get their hands on, so they took Czechoslovakia's too. <laughs> oh. Here you go, fellas, to Russia with love. You sure earned it the hard way. Well, by golly, it's flying fickle finger of fate time again. Here, here, and who is our lucky winner this week? A real bunch of big spenders, Dick. The drug industry of America. You've never really quite forgiven them for putting that rat poison in Lucretia Borgia's food, have you? Yeah, no. <laughs> Have you now? No, 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 I forgot about that a long time ago. It's a little more than that, I'm afraid. According to the Wisconsin Attorney General, Bronson LaFollette, mm -hmm. the drug industry spent more than $600 million on advertising in 1967. $600 million? That's right. However, can they afford it? Well, uh, by raising the price of medicine would be my first guess. Uh -huh. The Wisconsin Attorney General said, and I quote, the drug industry now spends four times as much on advertising as it does on research. Unquote. Now then. Oh, hold it, hold it. They spend $600 million a year on advertising, right? That's right. Uh, that's four times as much as they spend on research, right? You got it. Now, you don't suppose that that could have anything to do with the high price of medicine, do you? Shrewd guess. Huh? Shrewd, shrewd, shrewd. Thank you, sir. You got a point there. Yeah, uh, well, one good point deserves another, as I always say. Here you are, drug industry. Take one of these every four hours. Call me in the morning. <laughs> <laughs> Well, folk, once again, it's time for the Flying Fickle Finger of Fate Award. Who's the lucky winner tonight? The Bureau of Land Management, and they're the people you all know who see to the needs of the Indians. Well, what has the great white bureaucracy done now? Hang on, I'm going to tell you. By <laughs> treaty, the Shoshone Indians have always been guaranteed the right to pick the pine nuts on the reservation. Well, aren't pine nuts a basic food of the Shoshone diet? You shock me with your erudition, sir. Well, you're kind of say yes. But now the Bureau of Land Management is demanding that they get a permit. 
and pay a tax on the pine nuts that they gather for food. Well, with that kind of double dealing, why mess in the forest? That's right. well, they can go right to the Bureau of Land Management and find all the nuts they want. <laughs> Here, Bureau of Land Management, place this in your wiki up. Tune in next week when the flying fickle finger of fate, or the rigid digit, as it's known in Burbank, goes to Egyptian President Nasser for his invention of the short war. <laughs> Once again, it's time for the Flying Fickle Finger of Fate Award. All right, you are, sir. Mm. Tonight's winner is the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission. Oh, what did those boys do now? Hang on, I'm going to tell you. Oh. The commission ruled that classified job ads can no longer be listed under separate male and female headings because that's discriminating on the basis of sex. And if there's one thing I don't want to do, it's discriminate, it's against sex. <laughs> right, mm. whatever your name is. And so, here's a flying <laughs> fickle finger of fate to the members of the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission for deciding there's absolutely no difference between men and women. You know, I'm so inspired, I decided to be the first on my block to go along with this new ruling. Good man. Today, just today, I went out and hired a new houseboy. Great. I'll be right there, Hortense. <laughs> It's time now for the Flying Fickle Finger of Fate Award. Who gets the little goody this week? The voters of the city of Youngstown, Ohio. The whole city? The whole city. What'd they do, elect Mayor Daly? No, no, the, uh... <laughs> not in Youngstown, no. You see, for the sixth time in two years, the voters of Youngstown voted down an increase in school taxes. So a lot of cities do that. Yeah, but in Youngstown, they don't even have enough money to keep the schools open that they have now. They sent 28,000 students home at Thanksgiving, couldn't afford to open the schools again until January the 2nd. Thrifty, huh? Oh, yeah. <laughs> and, and they won't even buy the kids new textbooks. Still using antiquated textbooks. Well, the kids in Youngstown can open their school books and read that uh, someday we'll be able to freeze food. Huh. And maybe someday, soon, we can put a man into outer space. Cat zoops. Youngstown really keeps up, huh? Oh, yeah. What do you say we give it to them? I'd say huh? they got it coming. All right. A ward up? Yeah. Voters of Youngstown, see the pretty statue. <laughs> Take the pretty statue and stick the pretty statue in your pretty pencil box. And tune in next week, folks, when the Flying Fickle Finger of Fate Award or the nifty knuckle, as it's known backstage, goes to California Governor Ronald Reagan. There's no reason right now, but we're sure he'll come up with one by next week. Well, I see by the little old finger in the air that it's time once again for the Flying Fickle Finger of Fate Award. Well, who gets the upright appendage tonight? Those crack shots down at the Winchester Rifle Company. Really? I thought they were doing a bang-up job. Well, they are. This is for their youth education program. You see, they've realized they've only been making guns for adults, and they've completely ignored the kids. Oh, but some big shot took care of it, huh? Yep, they've come out with a kitty size. A number one bang-bang drop-em-dead shotgun for the young set. A real shotgun for children? Right, including, as the Winchester ad says, and I quote, a brass bead sight that helps the untrained eye zero in on target. And inside, there's that one-shot shell just waiting to teach a boy how to make every shot count, unquote. That sounds kind of dangerous to me. Well, I guess you have to take chances if you want to sell shotguns. You're absolutely right. Award up. Here, Winchester Rifle Company, to avoid accidents, jam this in your loading chamber. <laughs> Isn't that statue pretty small? Yeah, but when it grows up, it'll really do some damage. Be sure to tune in next week when the flying pickle finger of fate, or the wonderful wiggler, as our choreographer calls it, will be given to the United Nations for all the wonderful work they've done in Biafra. <laughs> Well, once again, folks, it's time for that suspenseful moment when we find out who gets the Flying Fickle Finger of Fate Award. And who gets the Wicked Weenie tonight? The General Telephone Company of Southern California. What'd they do, give you a wrong number? Oh, no, not me, but an employee of General Telephone, a fellow by the name of Jerry W. Finefrock, felt that his bosses were short-circuiting the public by offering a limited choice of phones, suffering a chronic shortage of equipment, and further stating that they, General Telephone Company, are not responding to charges of malpractice and improper conduct. Well, 
something like that could cause a man his job. Well, you put your little dialing pinky right on it there. Hmm. See, the company admitted that the employee had a right to testify before the Public Utilities Commission, but they fired him because he did. Well, I think we should do something about that. <laughs> hey, General Telephone, it's for you. Be sure and tune in next week, folk, when the flying fickle finger of fate, or the Midas touch, as my group calls it, <laughs> will go to William Buckley for his philosophy of never clarify tomorrow what you can obscure today. I don't understand that. That's old Bill Buckley for you. <laughs> yes, folks, Dick is right. It's time for what turns me on. The Flying Fickle Finger of Fate Award. Yep. And tonight's fickle finger involves a telephone directory published by the Defense Department under President Johnson, listing the civilian officials in the Johnson administration. 80,000 copies of the 400-page directory were printed at a cost to the taxpayers of $40,000. That seems reasonable enough to me. Oh, well, certainly. It's reasonable, except that according to the Associated Press, six days after the directory was published, the Nixon administration took over. And most of the people listed here were leaving the Defense Department forever. You mean they'll have to spend another 40000 in only six days? You've got it, pal. Yeah, but not for long. Former Defense Department officials, let this finger do the walking through your yellow pages. And tune in next week, folks, when the flying fickle finger of fate, or the precious protuberance, as our makeup chappies call it, goes to the Navy Department for their swell welcome home surprise to Commander Buca of the Pueblo. And now, as we travel further along memory lane, it's time for this season's first Flying Fickle Finger of Fate Award. And pray tell who gets the daring, delightful, darling, darting, digitus, derringer this time. <laughs> the fun folks at the Pentagon who approve the projects and spend the money for our military defense program. Oh, you got to be careful. Remember those um, five sides to every story at the Pentagon. That's true, but according to an article in Newsweek, the poor babies have been forced to scrap a few of their pet projects. Well, maybe they could save us a few dollars. Well, yes, they could. And no, they didn't. Uh-huh. <laughs> Regardez-moi. Hmm. The B-70 bomber, the nuclear-powered plane, Shark, uh, I mean the snark robot bomber. So they blew a few bucks. Nobody's perfect. The Navajo missile. The dinosaur space plane. There's more? Ah, uh -huh. is there ever? The Skybolt air-to-ground missile. Hmm. A grand total. What does that come to? Nine billion dollars and change. Yuck. Hmm. Should we let them have it? Well, I think they should get something for all that money. Okay, Pentagonians, take this and place it carefully up with your other richly deserved booby prizes. Oh, um, and incidentally, uh, Pentagon people, uh, before you leave your desks and grab your guns, you're sharing tonight's award with the beloved Congress of the United States who allotted more money to you than to the poverty, education, and housing programs combined in their new government of the Pentagon, by, by the, the Pentagon, Pentagon and, and for the, the Pentagon. Pentagon. <laughs> Hello there. Once again, it's time for the Flying Fickle Finger of Fate Award. Or El Dedo Delicio as a delicioso. Delicioso? <laughs> Easy for you to say. Yes. <laughs> as they say south of the border. And who gets it tonight? Well, let's look at the facts, first of all. Recently, Fred S. Royster, on behalf of the Committee of Growers of United States Tobaccos, testified that growers believe, and I quote, mm -hmm. it is possible that the relaxation and contentment and enjoyment produced by smoking, has lengthened many lives. Oh, sure it does. You know, my cousin enjoyed smoking, and it lengthened his life all the way till he was 32. All the way till he was 32. Yeah, do you like that? <laughs> Pinky Lee couldn't have said it better. No better than that. And he was so relaxed and contented, we planted him in a flip-top box. For sure. For sure, indeed. Well, Fred also argued against health warnings on cigarette ads on these grounds, and I quote, a vendor should not be required to disparage his wares. Now he's got something there. Darn right. Why, the next thing you know, people will be bad-mouthing emphysema. They might. <laughs> well, I guess tonight we'll have to give a king-size filtered, filtered fickle finger to the Surgeon General. Well, why the Surgeon General? Well, we'll give him the following instructions, Surgeon ah. General. Make an appointment with Fred Royster. Mm -hmm. and when old Fred gets to your office, we think you'll know what to do with this. <laughs> you'll think of something, Doctor. <laughs> Fred will love it. After all, it's a silly millimeter longer. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Filtered, too. 
be sure and tune in next week, folk, when the flying fickle finger of fate or the slick, sly, slender sliver of love and devotion, as our clever, cute card holder calls it, will go to George Wallace's American Independent Party, who dropped the independent from their name. Governor Wallace, you may have dropped the I from your AIP, but you're still ape to us. <laughs> Well, folk, it's that time again when we award the Flying Fickle Finger of Fate Award. And who gets the noxious knuckle now? <laughs> Listen to this one, folks. A small group of California legislators who, without public discussion, have been quietly planning a new 24-floor, twin tower, state capitol building. Well, why worry about that? Somebody's bound to notice a thing like that in time. Yes, and we hope they'll also notice that it started out as a $32.5 million project, and now it's up to $65 million. Oh, double your pleasure, double your fun. Yeah, well, then maybe. Now, the first model was scrapped when they found they had left out the underground parking, so they got another architect. Aha! Uh -huh. I'll bet this one's got a car, huh? Now, the uh, committee men have taken trips to a number of cities, and what's really weird, uh -huh. two California senators spent 23 days in Brazil and South America just to look at buildings after the second model was completely finished. Well, who's going to notice a couple extra nuts in Brazil? <laughs> And so, for allowing the whole project to get so completely out of hand that the state capitol building will cost California taxpayers almost half a million dollars for each and every lawmaker's office, we salute the California legislators. And give to that little group of penny-pinching politicians mm. our coveted Flying Fickle Finger of Fate Award. And if you have any questions as to where to place it, Ask any California taxpayer. I'm sure he can suggest an appropriate parking place. Sure and tune in next week, folk, when the flying fickle finger of fate or the wild and wonderful wayward winged weenie will wend its way to those wonderful wizards of ooze whose constant offshore drilling has helped turn our California coastline into the slickest thing you've ever seen. <laughs> Once again, dear friends, it's time for us to award the coveted flying fickle finger of fate. And who gets the prodigious pinky this PM? Well, it's the same old crowd again. You mean? That's right. For the first time in the history of the show, we're going to award it for the second time. Hmm. The same people, those hmm. boys at the Pentagon. And what have those five-sided squares done now? Well get a load of this. The superintendent of schools at Lake Arthur in New Mexico reports that every time he looks out of his window, he sees this tremendous hole in the ground. And he doesn't dig it. No, but the Pentagon did. Uh -huh. At a cost to the taxpayers of $22 million. Well, we've been in the hole at the Pentagon before. I'm sure they have something in mind for it. Well, they did. It was going to be a missile site, you see, but the program was abandoned. So now we got a hole out there and it cost us $22 million. I'd say we were in pretty deep. Well, I'll tell you how deep. According to the local school superintendent, John Havner, mm -hmm. that money would have financed his school district for the next 110 years. Aha! Uh -huh. So take this, you burrowing beauties oh, in the good. Pentagon. <laughs> and if you have any doubts, get in touch with us. We'll tell you where to bury it. <laughs> Sure to tune in next week, folk, when the flying fickle finger of fate, or the tall, terrible, tantalizing tickler, as our robust researcher calls it, will go to all those wonderful manufacturers of DDT, the groovy pesticides that will kill both sprayer and sprayee. I guess they think DDT means drop dead twice. <laughs> Oh, there they are out there. Hi there, friends and neighbors. It's time once again for the Flying Fickle Finger of Fate Award. And I guess that pile of letters under your arms are a request for the uh, stiff steel steady stiletto? Hmm? Uh, no, not even that. Hmm. Uh, this is just some junk mail I've received in the past few days. Aha! Uh -huh. Been carrying on a little correspondence with Dr. Timothy Leary? Oh, no, you? you dummy. Not that kind of junk. I'm talking about junk mail. It's the kind of stuff you get from people whom you don't know and you don't, and don't know you. Well, it strikes me that you wouldn't have a whole lot to say to each other. Exactly my point. <laughs> Who needs it? Well, hold it. We forgot to give the uh, finger to the mailman. Oh, no. 
no. I give it to the poor mailman. It's not his fault. Hmm? Many of the state's Department of Motor Vehicles, they're the one who get it. Well, why, pray tell? Because those friendly little pen pals actually sell your name and your address to mail order houses, and they, in turn, send you all that junk mail. Isn't that keen? Hey, that's an invasion <laughs> of privacy. Oh, well, of keen course privacy, it is. But... Yes, it is an invasion of privacy. Well, in that case... Department of Motor Vehicles, we'd well, like sir. to invade your privacy with this. That's it. And with it, this laugh-in extra. Uh -huh. Now, this is just all the junk mail we've collected this past week, and there's lots more where it came from. We'll make sure you get it all. Right, girls? Happy New Year! Well, Dickie Bird, it's time once again for the famed flying fickle finger of fate. And who gets the intrepid index this time? None other than United Airlines. Oh, did they send your luggage to Battle Creek again? No, no, they missed that this trip. They fired black stewardess Debbie Renwick for not cutting her hair. You're putting me on. No, I wouldn't do that to you, sir. Miss Renwick, you see, wears a natural Afro hairstyle, and United says it was one inch too long for their standards of good grooming. Boy, they'll go to any lengths to get their way. Well, Debbie, you see, didn't think she needed a haircut, so she was fired. And United says that if she did cut her hair one inch, they'd bring her back, see? Don't do it, Debbie. Give them an inch and they'll take a style. <laughs> That's right. Ready to give it to them, Dick? I sure am. Here you are, United. Fly this in your friendly skies. <laughs> As I used to say on My Little Margie, it's time now for the Flying Fickle Finger of Fate Award. Well, tell me, who gets the potent prober this time? Just about to tell you. The United States Department of the Air Force. Uh, they go a little wild in the old blue yonder, do Well, they? in a way, yes. Mr. A.E. Fitzgerald, a top efficiency expert for the Air Force, said that the cost of the C-5A transport project would go two billion dollars over budget. Aha, so the Air Force commended him for his good work, huh? Well, not quite. You no. see, Mr. Fitzgerald blamed the extra cost on bad management uh -huh. and inadequate cost control on the part of the Air Force, and he said so before a Senate subcommittee. Well, isn't that his job? Well, not anymore. He got fired for that? <laughs> well, not according to the Air Force spokesman. Well, it sounds like he got fired for well, that. Well, no, you see, what the Air Force did was to eliminate his job. Well, he got fired for that, all right. <laughs> and Air Force Secretary Robert Seaman said that Mr. Fitzgerald's job was abolished in an effort to save money. Whoops, watch it, Mr. Secretary. You know what happened to Mr. Fitzgerald yes, for sir. trying to save money. <laughs> Better be careful. So here it is, Air Force Department. Take good care of it. With proper management and adequate cost control, this can really help you take off. <laughs> Well, Dirk, to uh, Dick, tonight's Flying Fickle Finger of Fate Award goes to the Farmer's Home Administration, a division of the Department of Agriculture. You knew that, of course. Well, what could the bucolic bureaucrats do to earn the winged wiggler? Those bureaucrats? Well, I'll tell you what they did. According to a national network story, they've spent millions of tax dollars guaranteeing federal loans to build more than 400 private country clubs and farm communities. Well, that ought to be great for everyone, rich and poor. Well, yes and no. Yes, the rich know the poor. Ah, oh, well, I guess they figure it gives the poor farmers a nice place to live uh, next to. Well, there's more. There is oh, yes. more? Now, some of those federally financed country clubs seems to have overlooked the anti-discrimination laws. Oh, you mean mulligans aren't the only things not allowed on the uh, first team? Ah, you caught on real quickly. The manager of the Natchez Trays Golf Association of Mississippi, which received a $265,000 loan, says to his knowledge, no Negroes ever played on his course. Oh, I'm sure he'd have noticed. I think so, but he says, if we had Negroes to come here and ask to play the right quality people like we think we are, why, well, we'd welcome them. I'll bet some of his best friends are caddies. <laughs> and so, Farmer's Home Administration, well, let us play through with the old fickle finger. This ought to take a few strokes off your game. For <laughs> it's time once again to present the Flying Fickle Finger of Fate Award. Who gets the gold? upon the musical element. I think they could pick at <laughs> me, couldn't time they? time for the award. Well, who, who gets the golden groper tonight? The National Security Agency. They bugged CIA headquarters? No, no, no. They seem to have developed a security leak. Ah, there's a top secret plumber in the house? Somewhere. It's not that kind of leak, Dick. Uh, According to the Associated Press, yeah. Washington real estate developer Edward Cook oh, was to attend a zoning meeting and needed to know the number of employees at NSA's... Uh, 
facility at Fort well, Meade. I see. We just pick up the phone and say, hello, National Security Agency. How many spies you got there? Well, you see, that's very good thinking. Yeah. Mr. Cook did that. He called them, but they wouldn't tell him. Well, couldn't he just count the cloaks and daggers and divide by two? Well, he didn't have to do that because he was able to get the information from an unimpeachable source, the Russian embassy. The Russian embassy? That's right. It seems kind of funny they'd know, and NSA wouldn't even tell an ordinary American citizen. Well, that's why we're going to give the fickle finger to the National Security Agency for so zealously guarding one of America's vital secrets against Americans. Well, here you go, and this uh, gold little goodie should stop your security leak. By the way, Dan, how many people do work there? I'm sorry, that's classified. Okay, old unimpeachable source. Time once again for the Flying Fickle Finger of Fate Award, and tonight's award is a dilly. And we're not slipping it to a pickle factory. No, sir. Tonight's recipient is the Department of Interior. Yes, they've been deserving it for a long time. But it seems they have been allowing the Fook Fur Company to have a monopoly in their business on the Pribilof Islands off Alaska's coast. Tell our friends what those folks from Fook do up there. I intend. <laughs> folks? The folks from Fook, uh, once a year, this privately owned company goes to these government-owned islands and they harvest the seal crop. That's right, and the way these uh, Fook fur folks do it is to drive the seals inland until their lungs are bursting. Yeah. And then they just club them to death with those heavy poles. <laughs> <laughs> well, and Miss Alice Harrington of the Friends of Animals recently went up there to uh, photograph this annual massacre, but the mm. department regulations state that visitors to the area can't get too close while these animals are being clubbed. Ah, oh, yeah, they say they're afraid the visitors might scare the seals oh, into yeah. trampling each other to death, you know, which I I guess would take all the sport out of it. Sure. So, uh, here it is, Department of Interior. Sorry we can't give you a monopoly on these things. Uh, just don't think of uh, this as our seal of approval. No. Now, as I was saying before, we were so rudely interrupted. Tonight, a special award for a special person, Martha Mitchell. Say, didn't she write Gone with the Wind? No, that was Margaret Mitchell. Oh. This is the wife of Attorney General John Mitchell, and she's much better known for what she says than for what she writes. Oh, that Martha Mitchell. Right. Well, what'd she do? Now, Dan? Now, Dick. Ah. According to articles in the New York Times and the Los Angeles Times, Mrs. Mitchell recently called United Press International to blast the nation's educators. Hmm. She said that they were responsible for all of our troubles in this country. Hey, she ought to tell that to President Nixon. Why is that? Well, he's been under the false impression that pollution, poverty, and North Vietnam have been, you know, they have something to do with our politics. Oh, no, Mrs. Mitchell was further quoted as calling the Academic Society a bunch of sidewalk diplomats that don't know the score. And she said, uh, they're at fault for a whole generation of children. Hmm, well, maybe they don't know the score, but if they're responsible for a whole generation of children, some of them must have known something. Yes. Uh, Mrs. Mitchell goes on. She certainly does. Yes, speaking of professors, she says, uh, they don't know what's going on. They don't have any right to talk. Well, now that sounds like she figures when it comes to free speech, there's only enough to go around for her. Maybe so. Huh. See, isn't it unusual for an attorney general to let his wife talk like that? Oh, well, uh, he didn't know about it. She made the call to UPI from some place where uh, he couldn't hear her, you see. Very clever. Where? Yeah. Uh, well, uh, she made the call from, um, well... She made those remarks from the bathroom? Uh, <clears throat> yes. yes. <laughs> well, somehow that makes a lot of sense. <laughs> Never mind that now. It's time for the award. Here you are, Mrs. Mitchell, in return for all those lovely thoughts, the golden goodie is winging its way to your private phone booth. And just remember, it is not only an award because the functional fickle finger can also be used for dialing. <laughs> Good voice. And now it's time for Laffin's famous flying fickle finger of fate award. And once again, the winner in Washington is the Pentagon. Yes, sir. <laughs> According to articles in the Washington Post and the Los Angeles Times, it seems our five-sided fumble factory was recently delighted to discover 5,000 tanks it didn't even know existed. They found them in West Germany, where for years they've been assigned 
as reserves for the NATO tank force. Uh, now, these tanks from Britain and West Germany, as well as the United States, are worth several billion dollars. Billion dollars. Billion. And one would think they'd be carefully hidden. One would be wrong. They're parked on spur roads along West Germany's Autobahn, visible from the air and vulnerable to attack. An unnamed spokesman for the Pentagon did not confirm or deny the existence of the 5,000 extra tanks. Mm -mm. <clears throat> However, he did say that the statement that the Pentagon didn't know about the 5,000 tanks was bunk. <laughs> How's that for logic? Uh -huh. <laughs> so, to the strains of tanks for the memory, <laughs> here's our fickle finger with a string around it. That's right. Please be more careful. As the old saying goes, that's all the tanks you get. Uh, and as a reminder, some other things you better watch for, uh, like a plane, a boat, a tank, and some tax dollars. Yeah. You've been losing a lot of those lately, too.